good morning, and thank all of you for coming to this session. I'm glad you were able to make it. Uh, my name is Sean Parnell. I'm Vice President of Public Policy at the Philanthropy Roundtable. One of my uh, areas of focus in that position is working on the issue of philanthropic freedom, which we define very broadly as the right of philanthropists to make their own decisions in terms of who they give to and how they organize their giving. Uh, not everybody necessarily agrees with this principle, or at least agrees with the very robust definition that we at Philanthropy Roundtable have on this. Uh, one of the concerns that has been raised in recent years about philanthropic freedom and philanthropy in general is the degree to which it might possibly undermine democracy. Uh, one proponent of this particular argument uh, is David Callahan, who has recently written a book titled The Givers, Wealth, Power, and Philanthropy in a New Gilded Age. And uh, for those of you interested in what I hope was a capable response to David's book, we have at our uh, literature table at the back a reproduction of an exchange that David and I had on this topic that he featured on his website a few months ago. Uh, another proponent of the view that philanthropy poses some risk to democracy is Rob Reich, uh, who we are joined by uh, today. Rob is a professor at Stanford University in political science. He is also uh, the director of Stanford's Center for Ethics in Society, uh, the co-director of the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society, uh, and the co-editor of a recent book t titled Philanthropy in Democratic Societies. He's spoken on this topic uh, frequently over the last several years, uh, giving a variety of interviews and, and presentations, and uh, we're very pleased that he was able to make it here with us today. Uh, someone who takes maybe a, a little bit different perspective, a little bit closer to Roundtable's own, uh, is Heather Higgins, president of the Randolph Foundation in New York City. Uh, Heather is also the president and CEO of Independent Women's Voice and chairman of Independent Women's Forum. Uh, she is a board member of the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, and perhaps more relevant to today, uh, she is a member of the board of directors at the Philanthropy Roundtable, and also the chair of our policy committee, and she has been an indispensable champion for philanthropic freedom. Uh, finally, moderating the discussion today will be Kristen Campbell, the executive director of Philanthropy Adv ad, uh, for active civic engagement, uh, better known as PACE. She's responsible for advancing that organization's mission, which is to inspire interest, understanding, and investment in civic engagement within philanthropy, and to be a voice in philanthropy in conversations taking place in the fields of civic engagement, service, and democratic practice. Uh, I am looking forward to what I think will be a very lively and robust discussion, and uh, I hope you'll join me in welcoming our panel. Thank you so much, Sean, and thank you all for being here and having all three of us be part of this important discussion. I believe that the framing and uh, the title of the panel is two perspectives on philanthropy and democracy. And so what I hope we might be able to do today is shed some light on some of the various perspectives to Sean's point that exist at the intersection of philanthropy's role in democracy. Maybe find a point of agreement or two if we if we can, um, but perhaps most importantly, have a principled and civil yet spirited discussion about the different perspectives that people bring to this, so that we can really understand some of the complexity and nuance of this question. So, with appreciation to Sean for the great framing, I'm just going to jump right into some of the questions that we have today. Um, and the first one that I want to start with is when we say philanthropy and when we say democracy, both of those terms can be defined in a number of ways from both a 
values perspective as well as a, as a process perspective. And one of the things that I think can be challenging, and, and Sean noted the exchange between he and David, um, is how we make sure that we're talking about the same things and therefore not talking past each other. And so I'd love to start the conversation today to see if we can level set some of the assumptions and understandings around what we mean when we use those words. So if we could start at the very beginning and say philanthropy as defined as the love of humanity and democracy defined as government by and for the people, I'd love to invite each of you to share a little bit about how from a values perspective, what do you see as the overlap between those two concepts, and can you extrapolate that into what you think that means from a practice perspective? So Rob, I'd actually like to start with you on this one. Sure. Well, thanks a lot for inviting me. And uh, I want to make just a quick note before I answer the, the question that uh, perhaps some of you arrived in the room today thinking you might be seeing the former Secretary of Labor. So I barely <laughs> begun to speak, and you're already disappointed, perhaps, perhaps pleased. Um, <laughs> I, I uh, am used to showing up and people sort of leafing through the program wondering, it doesn't really look like him, and, uh, and I'm admittedly much lesser in stature, but I am greater in height. Um, uh, okay, to the question about defining philanthropy and defining democracy. Um, love of humanity is a nice way et etymologically to set the conversation. I, I think I'd offer a capacious understanding about how we ought to describe philanthropy from a values perspective, um, which, which is uh, the voluntary direction of private resources to some other regarding or public facing purpose. And those resources can take a number of different forms. They can of course be money, um, it can be time, it can be blood or your body, some, some you know, you know, literally physical asset. And I think more interestingly, unlikely to be a subject of conversation, but I'm currently working on trying to conceptualize data as something that ought to be the resource for donation treated as a philanthropic uh, resource. So I would say voluntary private donations, um, private direction of, uh, of, of resources to an other regarding or public facing purpose. Uh, and then with respect to democracy, uh, well, as someone who teaches political philosophy, um, you're liable to get from me a, a long lecture, an entire seminar on how to understand democracy properly. Uh, I'll, I'm happy to accept the definition you gave us at the start, the government of, by, and for the people. The essential thing in democratic societies is collective self-determination and the idea of, in particular, when you attach um, ideas of liberalism or classical liberalism to democracy, um, a limited government where the actions that are um, undertaken on behalf of all of us in a representative democracy are in some respect um, um, done in, an, in a manner in which we all have the opportunity to engage in the process that yields the outcomes. Um, so no, no one is barred from political participation in virtue of their rank, status, creed, et cetera, et cetera. Fam familiar ideas here. I don't have anything um, novel to add, to add to the classical definitions. Sure. Well, Rob, um, I know this is your first ph philanthropy right. roundtable experience. And so some folks here, while you write and speak on these issues a lot, some folks might be hearing them um, for the first time. And so one of the things that I want to share with you is as I've been walking around the conference with my little speaker ribbon on my badge, and folks have asked me, what are you, what are you speaking on? And what's the topic? And I've shared with them what we hope to accomplish here today. And your name has come up. There have been some interesting responses about um, people's interpretations of what they think that some of your um, positions oh, are. Good. I want to hear and them. So, well, I, I want to share with you, too, sure. because I want to make sure that we really are kind of level setting some of those sure. assumptions and being fair to you in the, right. the perspective that you're bringing. One was, does he believe that philanthropy shouldn't exist? No. I believe philanthropy should exist. OK. And does he believe that the government is a better steward of our charitable resources than foundations are? Also, likely not, I'd want to know more what steward means, because I think that invites a conversation about the various ways in which tax laws help to shape the way that philanthropy is institutionally or structurally defined. But as a simple answer to the question, um, if instead of the existing amount of philanthropy, 
both from ordinary small donors and from large donors in the, in the shape of a, a private foundation. Do I think it would be better for citizens if all of that money were collected by the government and distributed through ordinary democratic processes? Also, no. Great. Thank you. Um, Heather, would you like to share a little bit about your position on the intersection of philanthropy and democracy from both a values perspective and then extrapolating to a process perspective as well? Um, thank you. I'm not a professor, so I, I don't have quite the grounding, but I'll do my best. Um, I think uh, one of the things to hold in mind is that um, Democracy is something of which our founders were actually quite fearful. Straight democracy led to majoritarian tyrannies. And there are no, are no to the best of my knowledge, actual full-fledged democracies out there. They're either democratic republics or they're constitutional monarchies. One of the things that makes our country unique is that it actually is not only by, but actually for the people. We start out with we the people, not, for example, like the EU constitution, which starts with um, His Majesty the King of the Belgians, um, which is a rather different thrust. Um, so um, the founders were very conscious of this. They wanted a limited government because they were very conscious of the tyranny into which government could drift. Uh, and uh, so they wanted a very much of an engaged citizenry. And I would argue that they would argue, and I certainly believe, that philanthropy is in fact itself an act of citizenship. Uh, that it is part of the exercise. Tocqueville talked about one of the things that made our country so unique were, was the, volunteer, the volunteerism, the small platoons, the individual action. And Aristotle, if you go back further, talked about how essential it was if you had a republic that you inculcated good character because character led to habits and the necessary habits for a free society, a free people. You weren't relying on the monarch or the government to get everything right. You were relying on the people to do things that were constructive and helpful to their neighbors. Remembering that you know we've we've had a lot of period of discussing liberty, but every every right has a corollary responsibility. Uh, and so so really developing those was very much essential to a free nation and a free people. Um, in fact, Washington, I believe, wrote that it didn't matter so much what group you came from, but whether you were a good citizen. Because he felt that if this rather radical project was going to survive, it was going to, it was going to do so by voluntary association. And you only had voluntary choice to associate if people felt that things were moral and just. Um, so I would argue that philanthropy is essential. And by philanthropy, I would, I would include all forms, large and small, uh, charity and philanthropy. And I think you can make some differences in terms of how you define those. But there are, there's a wide breadth of things. Um, the, the, I guess where I would have a slight difference is that I don't believe that it necessarily, it depends how you define other regarding, but I'm not sure that it has to have a public purpose. Uh, it can have a civic purpose. It can have a humanitarian purpose. Uh, it can uh, be something that is merely spiritual, uh, that is, is of interest to somebody. Um, so I would define it, I guess, a little bit more broadly. Um, and then with democracy as being collective self-determination, that's a piece of it. But part of what makes this such a vibrant and free society is that it's only a tiny piece of who we are. And there is this wonderful independent sector that captures so much of the other aspects of our lives um, where we engage in decisions large and small. Yeah. Can I ask a quick clarifying question around what do you see as being the difference between a civic purpose and a public purpose? Um, civic to me, uh, and, I, and I haven't spent as much time thinking about this as I'm sure you have in your classes, but civic can be generally for the, the general good, whereas public to me implies a more political flavor to it. So I tend to use civic where I'm talking about things that are outside of the political realm, um, whereas, so we talk about civic engagement, it's not as opposed to public, which tends to have more, of, to me, at least a more political flavor to it. That's helpful. That's helpful. 
Um, I'd love to, maybe in an effort to start seeing where uh, the rubber meets the road in terms of potential areas for agreement on these perspectives and, and yeah, potential It would be so divergence. much more fun if you start with different. Yeah, we got to start with different. <laughs> right. Okay, well then I'm going to flip the order of my question right. then and say, can you each share one way that you think that private philanthropy is a threat? To democracy and maybe one or two ways that you think that they're mutually reinforcing or strengthening of each other. Sure. Heather, do you want to go first this time? Um, gosh, um, I'm not sure that it's human or philanthropy's job to contribute to democracy. Democracy is a process and philanthropy is a whole heck of a lot broader. And there may be some incidental benefits to democracy, and, and, but philanthropy does not exist to enhance democracy. It exists to enhance human beings and their lives and, uh, and the, the civic society in which we all engage and a, a myriad of other things uh, not, rather than the process of democracy per se. So whether you're talking about the March of Dimes and the development of the polio vaccine or the development of radar in World War II, which you could argue had a, a, a very dramatic benefit to democracy, uh, whether you're talking about safer driving, whether you're talking about libraries from Carnegie, um, or you're talking about the arts or conservation, um, those are not necessarily about enhancing democracy per se, though dem democracy arguably benefits from them. Um, Philanthropy's job largely is in, in large measure, but though not exclusively, to underwrite civil society, I would think, um, and uh, civic engagement, and the pluralism that comes from having a well-developed independent sector, and all the innovation that that breeds, which in turn creates benefits for society. Where I would argue that you have threats to democracy uh, funded by philanthropy, Two of the largest, I would argue, are anything that enhances the administrative regulatory state and anything that further develops a redefinition of the role of the courts. Uh, when we were founded as a country, the idea was that the people would have very much of a say in what the laws were, and if they didn't like the laws, they could unelect the people who had brought those laws in and bring in a new batch. Uh, but we've had the development of an administrative regulatory state that's unelected, that produces, I think, at latest count, 18 laws for every one that Congress passes, that has its own due process well, laws so that, for example, if you, the citizen, wants to take on an administrative regulatory body uh, through what's now called Chevron deference, the courts will defer to the agency itself to make up the interpretation of what that rule was that you were supposed to be following. So it's, it's a bizarre and really very uncivically engaged, undemocratic process. And similarly, one of the checks and balances on majoritarian tyranny by the founders was uh, a three-branch system of government where the courts were not supposed to be making laws, but they were supposed to be simply interpreting laws. And if you didn't like the laws, you had to go through the much harder process of changing the legislation. Legislature. And we've had a whole school of thought that's all for courts making law, which I would argue is particularly problematic if you believe in the citizenry actually having the authority, ultimately. I appreciate the distinction that you're raising about some of these things not necessarily being about democracy as a system, but benefiting democracy. So I want to draw that out from what you said. Um, Bob, threats and, and strengths. Sure. So here's where some differences, I think, will indeed emerge. Um, uh, Heather said that philanthropy is not meant to, shouldn't be conceptualized as serving democracy. It exists, she said, independent of it in certain ways and might have incidental benefits. I think that's uh, not, uh, not the way I'd want to frame it. If you simply asked me, does philanthropy exist to serve democracy, I'd also say that's not quite right, but here's the way I'd put it. Philanthropic acts, philanthropic behavior has existed since time immemorial. People have been altruistically motivated to do things on behalf of other people or in consortium with other people. Um, not primarily to benefit themselves, but to, to do things in conjunction with others. And um, that type of activity is 
basically written into every society we've, we've ever known historically. However, in any democratic society, a variety of laws and public policies give some shape to the way that philanthropic behavior is expressed. So as I mentioned before, the tax code defines in our country here a 501c3 sector with other types of nonprofit organizations. It defines certain privileges that donors have, donor direction in perpetuity, so that the donor's preferences in the, you know, the negative way to put this reach out beyond the grave of the donor to strangle future generations and hold them hostage to the preferences of the dead person. Um, these are not natural laws about the universe. These are the democratically arrived at decisions of a particular group of people in time. And so it's inevitable that democratic societies give shape to this time immemorial um, activity of philanthropy. All right, so I think that you have to view philanthropy and democracy as working in some relationship to each other. Not always a unidirectional philanthropy must always benefit democracy, but the laws are going to give shape to um, how philanthropy operates. And in fact, so far as I can make out, Philanthropy Roundtable partly exists in order to champion a certain legal regime to allow philanthropy to do the work that it thinks is most important. So th there exactly is the connection I have in mind to draw. All right, so. Um, the thing I think is worrisome about the current mode of philanthropy we see, I just say we live in what we could describe as a second gilded age. We have extraordinary income and wealth inequality that harkens back to the first gilded age, which was the moment in which the great American private foundation form itself was birthed in the Carnegie and Rockefeller era. And um, the extraordinary philanthropic freedom that attaches to people today as it attached to Carnegie and Rockefeller then is something important to attend to. And here's the thing I want to call attention to, which is that philanthropy is an expression or an exercise of power, especially when it's large philanthropy or big philanthropy. And in a democratic society, power deserves our attention and perhaps our scrutiny, our critical attention and critical scrutiny, I'm not against power. There's no such no sense in saying you're against power. I'm in favor of attending to where power exists. And we want to avoid places of hyper-concentrated power, which is worrisome for big philanthropy because in addition to exercising power, um, philanthropists, it's almost entirely unaccountable power. It's often very low transparency. It's a power that can be exercised in perpetuity. That's the point of setting up a foundation to take a perpetual form. And then there are these tax concessions that attach to it. So I would describe big philanthropy now, not ordinary charitable giving, but big philanthropy as the exercise of individuals to use their resources as they see fit, which is to say to exercise philanthropic freedom when you have a lot of resources to give away for some public facing purpose, other regarding purpose. Rob, can I actually ask a clarifying question yes, of what you mean when you say big philanthropy and how that differs from small philanthropy or charity? Like, is there is that quantified in some way? I just think that might be helpful. Sure. Um, here. Yeah, I, I don't have a, there's no um, derived from philosophical principle the amount that it's an ordinary philanthropy and then big philanthropy. Take as a starting point um, private foundations as opposed to ordinary charitable donations. Um, so uh, maybe we'll come to this. In what I've written, I think, perhaps counterintuitively, there should be a floor, a, a legal limit on the, on the size of a foundation, not a ceiling. So I, I think there is a way to convert the operation of large philanthropy, big philanthropy, um, into something that um, the power, the unaccountable power operates in a way that's healthy for a democratic society. Um, but I don't know. Take $10 million, $25 million as a foundation. I don't know. Okay. Pick a number. That sounds fine to me. Um, all right, but, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I, I know. I'm, 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 in my professorial instincts now are kicking in, and I mean to cut myself off. Um, <laughs> so we've got it's this. It's a good thing you're not a senator, because then it would be. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I, I, no no self-discipline. Um, I wanted to draw out the contrast in the views. Um, my worry is that we live in an age in which philanthropists, big philanthropists, exercise power. That's virtually true by definition, it seems to me. 
and it's unaccountable for the most part. I can explain why I think that's so if you, if you want to get into that. And what we have then is effectively a plutocratic element, a plutocratic voice in a democratic society, which that's the initial way I, want, I would set the tension. If democracy is meant to permit the equal opportunity for every citizen to participate in the project of collective self-governance, and philanthropists big philanthropists, by definition, people whose resources are larger than the average person's, are inserting their views into politics, as often happens, not with all philanthropy, but with some philanthropy, then we have a plutocratic element in a democratic society. And I haven't yet said that's wrong, that's immoral, that's inappropriate. I only say then we should pay attention to the insertion of these powerful voices into democratic politics so that our only response is not gratitude to the philanthropists. Philanthropy is voluntary action. It deserves gratitude for having um, been something other than private consumption. But when it's power, and it often is, it deserves criticism as well. Okay. There was a piece earlier this week that came out in Crane's Business Journal. Right. Rob, you were quoted in it, and I wanted to bring it up because I think it also relates to the session that we just came from with, right. with President Crow. Um, and the title of the piece was, Is Philanthropy Becoming Less Innovative? And the kind of thesis was that philanthropy is often um, using its resources to fill government gaps. Now, whether those gaps are times that government has completely failed its citizens, like the Flint water crisis, or times where perhaps some might argue that philanthropy might be a more appropriate institution to deliver those services than, than government in the first place. And folks that have been kind of advocates for philanthropy partnering with government would say that that kind of public-private collaboration allows for leveraging of greater resources and make sure that no one falls through the cracks. Um, I think this was also kind of brought up on, on the plenary that we just heard, given that we heard that ASU, a public higher education institution, receives more philanthropic money than they receive government money, and, and it was touted as a benefit in some ways that have allowed them to be entrepreneurial and, and innovative. Um, some critics of philanthropy government co-funding um, initiatives would say that it um, undermines the long-term risk capital Capital that philanthropy is often uniquely positioned to provide and has led to some of the greatest innovations in society. And some folks would also say that folks who think that um, government or that, that private philanthropy can fill government gaps misunderstand the scope of private philanthropy as it relates to um, government resources. So I, I lay out that argument just for folks who might not be familiar with it, and I'd love to hear from each of you, um, what do you think about kind of the public-private partnership between private philanthropy and government funding as it relates to either being a strength or a threat to democracy. And Rob, since I mentioned you were quoted in that piece, I'll, I'll kick it to you first. OK, sure. Well, I think I said in the, in the piece that um, to the extent that private philanthropists are funding various stopgap measures that um, folks in Detroit or in Flint or elsewhere in Michigan, where the government has been un unable to meet some of its existing obligations, um, I think I'm right when I say this, that the Ford Foundation announced a grant to help um, um, overcome the pension crisis that was in, in, De in Detroit. Um, I think that's philanthropic regress rather than progress, because just as you suggested, I think that what philanthropy is distinctively, not uniquely, but distinctively able to do is to serve, in the phrase you used, as a risk capital. It's a, it's a place where innovation and experimentation in social policy um, can happen in a decentralized way outside the space of government. And if a foundation gives money to the soup kitchen, there's nothing innovative about that. Just set up a donor advised fund and make the contribution if that's your philanthropic or charitable preference. You do not need the form of a private foundation to do ordinary social service delivery or enhancement. Um, if you want the particular privileges that attach to the foundation form, take a long time horizon, experimental, risk-taking approach to your grant making, and get in the business of innovation, most of which will likely fail, 
Um, but if you're just simply taking over some of the t responsibilities of government temporarily, as I say, I see that as regress, not progress. Heather, what do you think? Oh, there's so much here. <laughs> there is, isn't there? There is. Um, the first thing that I think it's useful to remember is that the idea of philanthropy used to be seen pretty much exclusively, as I said earlier, as an extension of being a good citizen. Uh, and I think it's important to remember that uh, equality in a democracy does not mean equality of participation. It means equality under the law. There was no delusion that everybody had the same assets or the same capabilities or the same interests or the same focus or anything. They, there was full recognition that there would be a wide disparity of talents, interests, abilities, and capacity. Um, but what matters in democracy is that you have equality under the law when you you know, you are in, in a court or when you are voting. Um, that does not mean equality of outcome. It does not mean equality of, you know, if, if you get to publish a newspaper, I don't automatically get to publish a newspaper too. Um, and so that shifted when you had the progressive idea come along. And that started with the idea that all of these problems that we had derived in, in large measure from these external social forces. And external social forces were so massive that it required a massive response. And in order to have a massive response, you needed to probably have professionals dealing with it. And the locus of those professionals would be in government. Uh, and they would benefit all of, all of the rest of us um, through that. Uh, the measure became not the morality of what you were doing, which was in fact viewed as sort of judgmental and unfair, but how much money you threw at a problem for the large measure. Um, I think that all those things are hugely problematic. Uh, and it's not a world view that I share. Um, but when I listen to your prescriptions, I am reminded of the story of, uh, if you'll permit my digressing, uh, Jim, who uh, starting in his early 20s had had awful headaches. And uh, he'd been to a bunch of doctors, and uh, nobody could figure it out. And finally, you know, 20 years into these increasingly awful headaches, he uh, finds a specialist who checks him up, down, and sideways, and says, you know, actually, I have, I have good news and I have bad news. The good news is that I can fix your headache and, and solve the problem. The, the bad news is um, that you have an incredibly rare condition and your testicles are pressed up against the base of your spine and that's what gives you these awful headaches and, um, and the solution is that we need to castrate you if you want to make this go away. And Jim was shocked and depressed and uh, it could hardly think straight though because the headache was so bad and he finally just said, well, okay, go ahead and, and cut them. And he, they do, he walks out of the hospital and uh, he's, uh, he for the first time in 20 years does not have a headache. He's also feeling like he's missing a rather important part of himself and a little worried about this, but he also starts to think that maybe this is an opportunity for a new beginning. And he's walking down the street thinking this and he passes the store, the store sells clothes, and he says, you know what, I'm gonna get a new suit to celebrate my new beginning. He walks in and there's an old man there and he says he wants a suit and the elderly tailor looks at him and says, you know what, absolutely, sir, 44 long? And he said, yes, exactly. 45 long, that's it, how do you know? He said, well, I've been in business for 60 years. And so as he's putting on this beautifully fitting suit, the man says, shirt. And he says, yeah, actually, the guy sizes him up and he says, 64 sleeve, 16 and a half neck. How do you know? Well, I've been in business for 60 years. He's putting on the shirt, he's got the suit, the man says, shoes looks at his feet and, and nine and a half E, and he said, yeah, how do you, and never mind, you're 60 years, I know. Puts on the shoes, they're incredibly comfortable, he's walking around, the tailor says, uh, and how about some new underwear? And he says, well, you know what, we're doing everything else, why not? And the tailor says, looking at his waist, 36. And he said, no, I finally got you on one. I'm a 34, I've been a 34 since I was 18. And the tailor says, you can't do a 34. If you do a 34, it'll press your testicles up against the back of your, the base of your spine and you'll have a hell of a headache. <laughs> so the, the point is, the, the, di the problem can be real, but if the diagnosis and the solution are wrong, you can actually make things worse. And, I, and I'm, <laughs> I'm listening. I'm wondering how my prescription is leading to that. <laughs> And so, you know, 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago, I did a debate here, and I actually am a vigorous opponent of the perpetuity of foundations. 
Um, and I think it is a huge mistake. Uh, as, as many of you may know, the, the, uh, the, or maybe you don't, the Rockefellers went to Congress and tried to get this done. And it was not only that they were disliked personally, um, but there was also some real important common law principles that this violated, this idea of creating a perpetual, unaccountable institution that would accumulate assets indefinitely, uh, that violated everything that we knew in common law. And they finally had to go and purchase the New York State Legislature, which I'm from New York, I can tell you, it's for sale. And uh, that's, where, that's where this came from. Um, but so the solution, I would argue to you, is not what you've prescribed here, which would in fact cut out a great deal of innovation. A lot of these foundations that are larger start small. It's where they learn. It's where they learn how to make things, do things differently, do things better, what works, what doesn't. There's a lot of trial and error. But there's also um, the, the problem that a lot of philanthropists are not cut out to be risk takers. There are a lot of people out there who are not inclined temperamentally, intellectually, whatever, to be the ones who are doing risk taking or innovating new solutions. I'd say that's a pretty small slice of our population. There are a lot of people who are motivated by taking care of real problems that they see in their communities, and they tend to do that well and better. And that if we want to have vibrant civic engagement and a very productive civil society, what we should do is return to the idea that we don't have foundations that exist in perpetuity. You've got charitable trusts whose maximum existence is lives and being plus, you know, 100 years. So essentially within the scope of the donor and the people who knew them, and at most the people who knew the people who knew the person who put it together, but it all has to be paid out. The money all goes back into society. It doesn't just accumulate. And you also do things like one of the things we are at the Philanthropy Roundtable advocating for is a universal tax deduction. So you broaden the participation because our view is that charity and philanthropy are both essential and they are and there is they're like restaurants your mode I think of requiring that everybody do the same thing which is interesting because well What's they all the be same the same thing is that all the foundations be large and they all do the risk tasting okay. innovative assessment right um, and National Center for Responsive Philanthropy a few years ago was had a, a vision in their head that all philanthropies, in order to be legitimate philanthropies, had to do social justice work. And so the problem that you've got is who gets to decide what these rules are? I would say democracy has actually been very involved with philanthropy by prescribing and and saying what is C3 and what is not, and beyond that, we leave it to the, the wide dispersal of the pluralism of our society. We have a lot of lousy philanthropy. That just goes with the territory, just as you have a lot of lousy restaurants. But to say it all has to be one thing because that's the one excellent thing is like saying that all restaurants have to be French restaurants. No, and our life would no, be no, much no. poorer to have that. No, uh, saying that foundations should champion long time horizon risk taking innovations is not saying we should have restaurants that are all French restaurants. It's saying that restaurants if you want to go with the analogy, ought to be doing something more than, than serving the familiar food we have. If, if that, and I don't even want to accept the analogy in a certain respect. What I'm saying is, if you want, I'm happy to describe most donors as uninterested or not disposed characterologically to risk taking long time rise in innovation. And then I just say, it's not that I want that philanthropy to go away. Don't choose the foundation form. Don't take a perpetual entity um, and do ordinary um, charitable giving from that entity. Do it from a donor advised fund or just write, write it from your checkbook or in, in an ordinary way. And let me try out an analogy on both you and the rest of you that comes from the, continues a conversation we just had if you were in the, the session with Michael Crow. Sometimes I, I try to offer the criticisms or concerns I have about foundations to a foundation audience or a philanthropic audience, not frontally, as it were, saying, here's my argument and here are my criticisms. Uh, here's an indirect way to come to the same point. Um, the private foundation form is an institutional design. It doesn't have to have the form it does. It was decided in a particular moment in history and evolved in certain ways. I happen to have, as Michael Crow was saying before, um, the extraordinary privilege of a different institutional design, tenure, which renders me mostly 
unaccountable in my job performance. Um, having gotten past the tenure bar, basically what he described it seems to me descript, you know, a, a fair characterization, that short of criminal behavior, there's nothing that my employer can do to sanction me or to fire me for my performance on the job. Now my guess is, most of you in the audience think that's a preposterous way of doing business, that tenure is an indefensible institutional design because it just provides an institutional environment for dead wood and laziness and um, people not to perform. What I want to suggest is that endowed endowments within private foundations are the identical institutional arrangement that tenure is. It's lifetime performance unaccountability and it's even worse in certain respects because it's perpetual. It goes on beyond the death of the initial donor. There's no competitors in the philanthropic marketplace. No one can put you out of business. Just like I have no competitors in my department. No one can decide because I didn't write an article for a couple of years to fire me. Um, what, if anything, would make tenure justifiable? I think it's the very thing that makes foundations justifiable in what I've been saying. You can convert this apparent vice of unaccountability into a type of democratic virtue, which is that what tenures have is what the endowment has. I have permission now to invest my talent in some long time horizon research project. Probably it will turn out to be just from the standpoint of history. Most scholarship turns out to be inconsequential, doesn't produce truth, doesn't amount to knowledge worth um, changing the world about. But the small amount that does, that might have taken someone 10 years or 15 years to create because they had to learn three languages. You know, they sit in a room and work on a theorem or a problem to solve because they had to conceptualize an entirely new field, whatever it turns out to be that's innovative. Well, that's a contribution to society that probably wouldn't have happened in business or in government. And so that's what I think should be happening in foundations as well. If foundations, if you want that particular form of unaccountable performance, then go long and be experimental, be willing to fail. If you just want to be giving money to social service organizations, fulfilling some affili affiliative needs, associational desires you have, use a donor advised fund. You do not need the foundation form for that. But if that's your position, and I'm glad that you clarified, thank you, um, why not simply encourage those who want to do risk-taking innovation to have a long-form charitable trust? What is the purpose of keeping the perpetuity for any institution where, by definition, you are going to have this unaccountable accretion yeah. of capital right. over time? Well, we, I think we share a view. I'm not in favor of perpetuity. Uh, scholars die, and that's the end of tenure. Um, and uh, I think uh, foundations should have a time limit as well. I, I'm, I'd be happy to extend it, you know, a modest amount of time beyond the initial life of the, the donor, but certainly not perpetuity. And I want to hear more about a charitable trust. Speaking about philanthropic freedom, I mean, another point I would want to make here is you say to someone who has tenure, it's dead weight, it's, you know, it provides laziness. And then I could say back, scholarly freedom, scholarly freedom, scholarly freedom. And so I say to the philanthropic sector and foundations, you have no competitive arrangements. You don't, you don't do anything that tries to measure these long time horizon outcomes. And you say back to me, philanthropic freedom, philanthropic freedom, philanthropic freedom. Okay, use the freedom in a way that's designed or harnessed to the, the design of the foundation. If you're not gonna, if you're gonna put it in a charitable trust, well, it's the idiosyncratic one by one decisions of scholars, uncontaminated, unconstrained by what it is that you say about what I should be doing with my time. That's, that's what tenure protects me to do, is to follow my own ideas. That's what philanthropic freedom protects for any individual donor to do, to follow your own ideas, unconstrained by what your peers think of you. Well, if you want to do that, then take advantage of that freedom. Don't do the humdrum small thing. If all I did as a scholar was to write a small article that was a minor contribution to knowledge, that just was a commentary on Heather's most recent piece, then you could put me on a five-year renewable contract and ask me, yes. what have I done? What have I done recently? I think that would waste the permission of tenure. I don't, no one deserves tenure if they do small ball incremental contributions. Go bold. Foundations, if you're in the foundation world and you do modest, small ball charitable contributions to social services, you're wasting the opportunity you have for the foundation form. Just put you on a five-year renewable contract, spend all the money out and give it to the places you already care about. You do not need a perpetual foundation form for that.
So I want to celebrate the fact that I think we might have found a point of agreement, though for very different reasons, <laughs> on a concern around perpetuity. perpetuity. Yeah. Is that fair to say? I think so. I think so. Although I've actually said that I'm opposed to perpetuity. Ed, have you actually said that? Or you just yeah. want them to be big foundations that go on in perpetuity? No, no, I, I'm against perpetuity. Okay. I, I, not, I, I wouldn't harness it to just the life of the donor. Maybe that's not your position no. either. Um, but so years, the, I don't think the Philanthropy Roundtable dug out of mothballs my uh, monograph, but it is on the website, I think. And it's, it was a debate that I did with Michael Joyce called, oh, you do? It is in the back. Yay! There is out of mothballs. Um, about all the reasons why I think it's actually counter to donor intent and philanthropic freedom yeah. to have this institutional form around, which will lead to arguments of things like tax subsidy, yeah. which is, we can argue about. So there's a couple of other points that I want to make sure we introduce into this conversation before we open it up. And one of them really builds on the philanthropic freedom, philanthropic freedom um, uh, point, which is, Heather, you are obviously a huge pro um, proponent of philanthropic freedom, freedom and personal liberty um, in giving. When we think about democracy, one of the great debates around democracy is where personal freedom ends and public good begins. Um, and so where would you, in, in relation to philanthropy, where would you draw that line? If anywhere, where would you draw that line between personal freedom and philanthropic freedom and a public good or common good benefit? You're phrasing them oppositionally, and I'd say that they're actually correlative. So personal freedom, as I said earlier, rightly understood outside of sort of a libertarian, sometimes sliding into libertine deracinated philosophy, <laughs> um, has this heavy component of responsibility. The, the more free you wish to be, the more responsibilities you have to the larger society and to your neighbors, and et cetera, as part of, of citizenship. And that is where the public good comes from, is from that exercise. Um, and it is through modesty about our own knowledge of what is good for the world uh, that I wind up in a position where I want to encourage maximum philanthropic freedom because I think there will be things that are funded that are a complete waste of time. And I think there will be things that are funded that are actually, that, that make my skin crawl and that are, in my view, antithetical to the public welfare. Um, but I also think that it is that marketplace of ideas and of innovation uh, that will, in the long term, create greater civic engagement, greater innovation, greater solutions to problems that will be helpful. And where democracy comes along is in the external forms. But I think, you know, just yesterday, uh, in fact, I think one of the people to whom the IRS apologized yesterday is sitting right here, Sonia. Um, if you were apologized to, yes, by the IRS yesterday over your tax-exempt form being unfairly uh, withheld for political reasons, uh, the, uh, the idea that the intrusions of government in terms of defining what philanthropy ought to be ought to be very limited because the temptations to abuse that because we're all human beings and we're all flawed, um, and we're all, we'd like to think that we're totally free agents, but in fact the realities are sad, that in fact government very often does not behave as, as it platonically ought to. Uh, there nor, are, nor philanthropists. Nor philanthropists, nor educators. Nor educators. Nor non-profit no, executives. None of us. No, there's, of us. there's this, uh, we've moved into a dialogue in our society which has a lot of um, moral Trumpism to it. Yep. You know, I'm more moral than you are because of my status or whatever, which right. is such buck. Um, and the, the idea here is that you, democracy does exist to define the rules of philanthropy, but then within that construct, you have a lot of freedom unless you are doing something like infringing on somebody's actual well-being um, or their rights. <laughs> yeah, um, I think there is some shared space here, though. I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll try to see just how much is shared, maybe, maybe not as much as I think at the moment. Um, 
Well, first, the description you gave of the relationship between philanthropic freedom and the public good, in which you said that you know some people will do things that are utterly wasteful, some people will do things that you find personally hateful, totally inimical to the public good. Well, that's a, a, another carryover to the analogy with tenure. There's some scholarship that will, from my point of view, is just an utter waste of a person's time. Well, you might as well just burn the, burn the articles or the books because it contributes nothing. And a whole bunch of stuff which, even if it's significant and useful, I find um, despicable um, because I think the conclusions are invalid. Now, I would nevertheless defend the right of people to carry out what I find to be wasteful research or research that is uh, against the conclusions that I would draw. So we have a lot of shared space there. And collectively, that enterprise, then, I think, redounds to the benefit of greater society. Um, Here's what I'm curious, though, about with respect to philanthropic freedom. So mentioning the IRS and the tax-exempt um, status of different organizations, you know, in the neck of the woods that I come from out in Silicon Valley, there's a, you know, I don't know if it's a huge movement yet, but certainly a small trend for some of the most extraordinarily wealthy people not to create private foundations, but instead to create social good LLCs. Mm -hmm where Facebook, Facebook um, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, the Emerson Collective, um, the Amidiar Network, there are many, many more of them popping up. And at least as I understand it, the reason that they're choosing the LLC form and foregoing certain tax benefits that would otherwise attach to them if they went the private foundation form is that they're freer in the LLC to do things that in the foundation they can't. So again, I'm curious, for someone who defends philanthropic freedom, um, is it your position that it would be better for people who have money to genuinely assume the fuller freedom in an LLC and forego tax benefits, or is it appropriate for foundations to be barred from making electioneering contributions and from doing various forms of uh, for-profit seed capital investment? Um, there's a lot of conflation here that I think is useful to pull apart, mm -hmm. if nothing else, just for my own clarity of thinking about it. I understand why there are rules against C3 organizations engaging in political activity. Um, and that, that, that constrains the freedom of the donor. That constrains the freedom of the donor. Um, and I think it's murky. I think there is a discussion to be had about public policy think tanks, although honestly they are a tiny percentage of the C3 donations that are made. Um, but if you're going to open that box, you have to recognize that you're also going to be getting into the fact that there are all sorts of entities that influence the political process, whether it's media or churches or, or businesses. whatever else, businesses. Um, but a lot of the time, if the business does it, it does it through a C4, or C6, or a PAC, and that's a business expense. It is not tax deductible. Um, we want to encourage civic participation, and we want actually in a democracy to engage in um, political participation. So I, I assume that when people are setting up this through LLCs, that they are fully expecting that they're going to be politically engaged, not unlike uh, Act Blue in Colorado, where they decided that what they wanted to do to accomplish their ends was take over the legislature, and they created C3 entities, but they also had a lot of non-C3 entities. They view it as a continuum. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if um, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and maybe they don't care about the deductibility, but others who are like them have both C3 activities that they do and then personally donate, which is the way a lot of wealthy individuals have been doing it to date. They, they sort of segregate out in their heads, okay, this piece I can do with tax deduction and this was political right. and this I have to do that way. Um, so no, it doesn't bother me that people are engaging. It's frustrating to me that some of the people are engaging in ways that I think are counterproductive, but that's just, I mean, as somebody who's on the right, I look at most of the new money that's coming and it's going to be on the left. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of resources that are being pushed to sure. promoting a worldview with which I don't agree, yeah, but, I, I, but I would defend their right to do so. Right, I get that. My question was not, um, what's your evaluation of their purposes, but rather I'm trying to contrast the round table's defense of philanthropic freedom as attached to foundations, and I'm offering up examples of a rival form with, with fewer or no tax benefits, the LLC, 
which seems to me descriptively to permit a donor greater freedom. Uh, we defend people's rights to give. Um, unlike certain other organizations which shall not be named, we don't do things like defending high death taxes because we think that will cre create the number of people who start foundations which will broaden our membership. That's not, uh -huh. that's not, we, we're not acting in the self-interest of preserving the philanthropy roundtable right. uh, in the public policy that we advocate. We are trying to start um, with the idea that what's important is not democracy per se. Democracy is important in this country as a way of defending human liberty and the capacity for human dignity and human flourishing. And that's what we are about. So whether there are other groups that are doing this through other forms, that's legitimate, but it's not something that we would, I don't think, oppose because it's not our area. Heather, one thing that you have brought up that I really want to appreciate because it's something that we focus a lot on at PACE is philanthropy as an act of good citizenship. And we've talked about these things at a, a pretty high systems level, but if, if we were to think about it in terms of the office of citizen, and this is the last question I have but before we open it up, so get to thinking what, what you guys want to ask as well. But if we think about it in terms of the office of citizen, what do you both wish, quickly, that people knew about the interplay between philanthropy and democracy and how it affects their everyday lives? And what would you say to individuals that want to be part of this conversation? Want me to go first? OK. Um, uh, I, would, I think I'll just harken back to what I said in the beginning, which is that um, I think that one of the default attitudes in, in society right now is that a person who chooses not to engage in private consumption but to do philanthropy of various sorts deserves only one thing in return for that decision, which is gratitude. And I think gratitude is indeed appropriate, but I think because large philanthropy is also an exercise of power, and power anywhere it exists in a democracy deserves our attention, our scrutiny. Um, big philanthropists and citizens to that extent ought to be examining all philanthropic activity with a critical eye, not just with an eye or an attitude of gratitude. Heather, last word before we open it up. Um, I would think that the average citizen um, should be thinking of it as an opportunity for civic engagement. Uh, if there's anything I regret, it's that we don't have an even more um, robust, independent civic sector uh, to solve the different problems that are attendant upon us. And the more people we get involved, uh, not only the happier I think they are as citizens, because part of happiness comes from being outward directed, right, rather mm -hmm. than being self-directed. And this is a big part of engaging in your society and your community. Um, and it'll, it will, that diversity of viewpoints will improve innovation and improve our capacity to solve some of the problems that beset us.